大陸咧都可以見到咁多嘅誒唔同嘅朋友咧出席今日我哋嘅公眾研討會啦。咁咧，今次咧就係我哋呢一個研究計劃第二次嘅公眾研討會，咁亦都咧想喺誒啱啱開始呢個研討會嘅誒、呃、開頭咧，去再不厭其煩地咧，講一講我哋成個研究計劃嘅、呃、目標啦，同埋中間咧會用乜嘢唔同嘅研究方法嘅。咁香港中文大學亞太研究所性別研究中心咧，就受到平等機會委員會委託咧。進行一項有關立法禁止性傾向、性別認同及雙性人身份歧視嘅可能性研究。呢項研究咧，由香港亞太研究所性別研究中心嘅跨學科團隊去負責。其中我哋有九名嘅成員咧，嚟自七個唔同嘅學科嘅，包括社會學文化研究、法律學、心理學、公共衞生、教育學啦，同埋社工學嘅。咁為咗達到今次呢一個誒研究立法可能性嘅目標咧，我哋係從三個唔同嘅面向咧去諗立法嘅可能性，包括立法嘅需要啦、立法嘅法律基礎啦，同埋公眾認知嘅程度、態度、知識同埋理解嘅。咁而今日嘅公眾研討會咧，就喺我哋第三個面向啦，去想知道公眾對呢一個議題點樣睇法嘅嘅嘅其中一個面向嚟嘅。咁可能誒、呃、在座嘅有啲朋友都誒、呃、出席過我哋上一次嘅研討會咧，就喺、是、六月二十九號喺理工大學嗰度進行嘅公眾研討會。咁當日咧亦都係、呃、有大概三百個嘅嘅嘅公眾人士咧，當中包括有 LGBTI 嘅嘅嘅嘅一啲、呃、非政府組織啦，亦都有一啲唔同嘅嘅誒對呢個意見持對呢個題目持唔同意見嘅朋友出席嘅。咁我哋嚟緊咧，再會喺九月二十七號咧，又會喺中文大學咧，再有、呃、另一場嘅研討會咧，去探討立法對社會嘅唔同嘅影響嘅。咁呢一個研究咧，會採取唔同嘅方法咧，去、呃、解答我哋嘅研究問題啦。包括咧，回顧同埋梳理喺香港過去對於 LGBTI 歧視嘅研究啦。亦都會咧喺香港咧進行兩組唔同嘅誒焦點小組嘅，包括係大概十組嚟自唔同社會階層嘅 LGBTI 人士，佢哋對歧視嘅睇法啦，同埋對、呃、立法嘅睇法嘅。亦都會咧去、呃、用呢一啲焦點小組咧去理解嚟自唔同職業啦、年齡啦同埋宗教嘅市民嘅睇法。咁當中咧包括可能對呢一啲嘅誒題目。有特別強嘅意見嘅一啲組織啦，包括宗教啊、家長啊、唔同嘅憂慮啊，同埋擔心，我哋都會處理嘅。咁我哋我哋都會咧以電話抽樣咧去訪問咧超過一千名嘅市民咧，係誒具代表性嘅公眾電話抽樣調查咧，大概喺誒十月同十一月左右嘅時間去進行啦，去了解咧公眾對誒立法嘅睇法嘅。咁亦都會去訪問相關本地同埋海外法律專家嘅意見啦。亦都會咧，正如頭先所講啦，主辦三場以交流意見啦，同埋招募公眾人士焦點小組成員為目標嘅公眾研討會嘅。咁另外咧、呃，我亦都有誒、呃、兩點咧，希望喺今日個公眾研討會之前咧，去、呃、交代一下嘅、呃。第一點咧，就係、是、大家可能都近排睇到好多新聞咧，知道、呃呃、平等機會委員會咧，而家另外亦都進行緊一個關於佢哋現行歧視條例嘅檢討嘅。當中咧，亦都有一啲誒題目，大家都好能關注啊，包括事實婚姻啊，或者係種族啊歧視呢一啲嘅面向。咁但係嗰個咧係平機會嘅另一個嘅研究項目嚟嘅，同我哋呢一個嘅研究計劃咧係兩個唔同嘅東西嚟嘅。一啲佢哋會處理嘅題目咧、呃，麻煩大家如果有任何嘅意見啊或者問題咧，都可以交翻俾平機會去處理嘅。咁我哋係誒呢個研究係唔會處理嗰啲問題。咁另外咧，我亦都、呃、想去、呃、再誒、呃、再同大家解釋一下咧，因為我明白到多數喺呢一啲咁誒咁有爭議性嘅題目上面咧，我哋喺啲研討會上面，哇去揾唔同嘅嘉賓咧，大家都一定會覺得啊，所謂佢哋唔同嘅立場啊，或者唔同嘅嘅嘅取態啊咁樣啦。咁但係大家亦都知道咧，其實去揾嘉賓係一樣好唔容易嘅嘅嘅嘅嘅嘅東西嚟嘅。喺今日咧，我哋非常榮幸咧，有五位誒、呃、對於呢個題目咧，都誒喺唔同嘅嘅嘅國家裏邊咧，都有一啲好相關經驗嘅朋友嚟到啦。咁但係之前咧，其實我哋都試過咧，去揾一啲所謂唔同立場嘅嘉賓啦。咁係誒，因為。
無論係時間嘅關係啦，或者其他嘅理由咧，佢哋都係、呃、都係今日係冇出席得到。咁所以誒，嗰度亦都想同大家去理解或者個方面咧，都係做咗好多嘅通西。點解個研討會之前咧，我特別希望咧、呃，去借呢少少時間咧，去、呃、多謝、呃、今日咁多位嘅嘉賓嘅嘅嘅嘅嘅朋友，因為今日好難得可以喺、呃、香港咧個星期六嘅朝頭早有一個公眾研討會，揾到咁多個唔同國家嘅嘅嘅嘅代表嚟到，包括、呃、張老師咧，就專登由台灣去飛過嚟幫我哋去講啦。Uh, and, I, and I also want to particularly thank uh, Boris and Stephen for uh, for speaking today as well, and also particularly Stephen that 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 um, I'm very grateful for for your presence today to to speak with us about the British experience and, and, and all the roads that have been travelled. Uh, you do. 咁亦都好多謝我哋嘅嘅嘅 MC 啦。之前上一次我都誒做漏咗一樣東西，我都想誒多謝我哋嘅誒工作人員嘅，因為大家我諗誒在座雖然可能有好多對呢、這個誒誒、呃、題目持好多唔同意見嘅嘅朋友，咁我哋都好多謝佢哋對於我哋嘅研究團隊誒誒俾嘅意見啦。咁但係亦都可能相對上對於做呢一個研究嘅嘅嘅工作人員，亦都好大嘅壓力嘅。咁我想。呃、我自己喺呢一度好多謝佢哋誒咁多月以嚟，一路之後亦都會再誒誒誒，俾、呃呃、我哋好大嘅嘅支持。咁上次我係好誒好唔小心地做漏咗去多謝工作人員嘅，咁我好想今次喺呢一度有機會去誒誒、呃、多謝佢哋嘅。咁誒誒誒，我而家就會將時間交俾我哋嘅 M C 啦。啊，仲有一仲有一樣東西想同大家講一講嘅，誒、呃、就係、是、關於誒、呃、就係、是、關於嗰個即時傳譯嗰度。咁啊，即時傳譯嗰度想大家，而家係咪在座嘅朋友嘅耳機都係冇問題噶嘛？係嘛 ？Is every is what is everyone's headset working and is the simultaneous interpretation working?、Uh, just to let you just to let you know that the、uh, English channel should be number one,、uh, Cantonese channel should be number two, and Mandarin channel should be number three, as I've been told. 誒、呃、據我所了解，誒、呃、耳機裏面應該中、呃、英文嘅頻道係一號頻道啦，誒、呃、廣東話頻道係二號頻道啦，誒、呃、國語頻道係三號頻道啦。咁麻煩、呃、如果大家嘅耳機有任何問題，請喺呢個時間向工作人員提出。Hope that all the headsets are working. If there's any problem with the headset, please do let the、uh, help us know and they、uh, try to help as soon as possible. And without further ado, I'll、uh, hand the time to uh, uh, our MC of the day, Professor Amy Barrow from Faculty of Law of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Good morning, everybody. And as as the topic is quite sensitive, I have to remind you of the house rules for today's event. And so.、Uh, Please bear this in mind. Be respectful when you're listening to other people's opinions. And firstly, you're required to register at the counter. So the fact that you're all here, hopefully you are all registered, and、um, before entering into the venue, participants who intend to express views at the public forum should put the number cards given during registration into the draw box. A draw is carried out to determine. The speaking order, so we do this as、um, fairly as possible. Participants who are not willing to ask questions in person, please write down the question on the question sheet、um, and put that into the draw box. So if you want to ask a question anonymously, you can do so. Please write down your question. The MC, that is me,、um, together with、uh, Sam,、um, will read any question aloud, and it can be. Uh, in both Chinese and English, so you can submit questions in Chinese or English. Participants are not allowed to bring large,、uh, large halos、um, or banners or any other unsuitable materials for the public forum,、um, or display any of these items. There'll be no photography, audio, or video recording permitted、um, without prior permission of the organizer. Activities including promotions, demonstrations, petitions, signature campaigns, or other acts of protest which may interrupt the proceedings of the public forum are not permitted at the venue. And as this research topic is fairly controversial, please respect different opinions and do not make personal attacks. 
participants who disturb the proceedings of the public forum or parties at the venue will be asked to leave. So please, please do bear that in, in mind. Um, be as respectful as possible and, and don't make personal attacks. Um, I presume that you've all read the house rules. They are there within, within your packs. Um, so if anyone does disagree with them, you are free to leave now. Um, if, if you uh, agree, I presume you're staying. So uh, we, we thank you for your um, participation. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers who are here uh, today from both within Hong Kong and also other jurisdictions. Um, so firstly, Professor Stephen Whittle, Professor of Equalities Law at Manchester Metropolitan <laughs> Mr. Boris Dietrich, who is a former Dutch legislator and advocacy director of Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual and Transgender Rights Programme at Human Rights Watch. <laughs> Miss Alice Milan, who's a registered foreign lawyer with King and Wood Malisons, based here in Hong Kong. Mr. Chang Hong Cheng, um, from an adjunct lecturer in law from National Taiwan University of Science and Technology, Taipei, Taiwan. <laughs> and Dr. Margaret Nguyen, practicing barrister and former legislative counselor within Hong Kong. <laughs> I'd now like to pass the floor to Stephen. and thank you very much everybody for coming here today, um, especially on a Saturday morning. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure for me to come here to Hong Kong. I've been coming back and forward for 20 years and it is one of my favourite places in the world with some of the nicest people. So thank you. Just to say about the advancement, I'm a professor of Equalities Law at Manchester Metropolitan University. I'm also a transsexual man. I was born female the age of 19 in 1975, I transitioned to become Stephen. So imagine Hong Kong 20 years ago, that was my experience 40 years ago. I had a partner, a wife of 36 years, we were able to legally marry in 2005, and we were able to legally adopt our four children by double insemination in order for me to become the children's father. And legally. The two oldest children that are at university both studying music. The next two are twins and will be going next year. Um, so it's been a, I've been very privileged as a transsexual person to come through the worst bits and to get to the best bits of life. Okay, I want to talk about the experience of bringing the transgender, the bringing transgender, transsexual equality into the Equality Act in the UK. How frightening are we? Well, in, 1990, in the 1990s, we were very frightening. In 1991, Smirnoff's vodka had this advert, nasty surprises, spiders in your soup, snakes in your bed, transsexuals. We were often, perhaps twice a year, somebody will contact me, we provide free legal advice service, and they will say, I've been suspended from work because somebody has accused me of being a paedophile and it will have been because they have found out that person is transsexual. In 2004, the government survey of religious ministers asked them about trans people attending church. 21% of them referred to the dangers of transsexual people presenting to children. Gender identity has absolutely nothing to do with sexual orientation. Transgender people, when they have transitioned, may be straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, it is not connected in any way, shape or form. Gender reassignment treatment was not, though the National Health Service provides it, it has been increasingly difficult to get in recent years. In the 1990s, the newspapers used to attack it regularly. They would say it cost the National Health Service a small fortune and it prevents ordinary people from having things like cancer treatment or hip replacements. 
Um, I often say, you know, I pay far more tax than the government ever paid for my gender reassignment surgery. Ten times as much, at least a hundred times as much. 1996, a survey, uh, a review of medical papers showed that, in fact, after gender reassignment treatment, 8% of transsexual people attempted suicide. Consequently, gender reassignment was not to be recommended. As such, this is a standard policy on gender reassignment, provision of gender reassignment in the UK NHS. This was a standard policy. It said on systematic evaluation, the treatment was identified as ineffective. Just look. Yeah. How ineffective was that? <laughs> I was blonde and very pretty. <laughs> Limited clinical value and an inefficient use of resources, given the high cost per quality adjusted life gained. On average, gender assignment in the UK costs the National Health Service in providing it between 20 and 30,000 pounds in total. So it's not cheap, but it's certainly not expensive compared to many other treatments. It was excluded for quite a long period of time. In 1999, after we had gained workplace protection in the European Court of Justice in 1996, the government decided to tidy up the trans equality um, provisions to make it easy for people to understand. So they said we could have workplace protection except for working with children or teachers and nursery residents, in other words, would have been dismissed. With other vulnerable people, so social workers, social carers, um, doctors, nurses, they would all be dismissed. In people's homes, so home carers would lose their jobs, plumbers, people like that, or in religious organisations. That was the proposal in 1999, and it also said trans people would be able to access the toilet of their new gender when judged by a senior manager to look reasonable. I often wonder what a reasonable person looks like. <laughs> Fast for Change was set up in 1992 by a group of transsexual people who felt that we needed to really challenge the orthodoxy that was being maintained about us. The 1999 regulations did go through. We got, in two weeks, 900 letters sent to government, including 160 from employers of trans people. The toilet provision was not included in the end, thank heavens. But everything else was. By the end of two years later, the employment court had found all exemptions, except the religious exemption, unlawful and unreasonable. In 2002, a hospital refused to dismiss her chaplain, a hospital chaplain who said she wanted to transition. The bishop threatened to take her license away, but of course her employer was the hospital. The hospital could not discriminate against her, so would have to pay somebody who couldn't function as a chaplain. In the end, the bishop gave up. The same year, a vicar transitioned. She was asked, her congregation were asked to seek her resignation. The congregation refused. The church gave up at that point pretty much. The Equality Review was started by the government in 2006 to overview all equalities law in the UK and see what it was like. Their first report simply said that there was no research data about transsexual people, so nothing could be said about it. I went to a public meeting where, in fact, disabled people, people of colour, actually were the people who stood up and said, this is not reasonable. If you're not going to, you have to do something about getting that data. So we got a grant of 12,000 euros to undertake research into trans people's experiences. We produced engendered penalties. You can find it on the internet with no problems. In engendered penalties, we looked at people's life. So we looked at education, the experience of being bullied, bullied for two status, children leaving school early without qualifications, the prejudice and harassment people faced with work discrimination, repeated job losses, and the move to fringe workplaces. Healthcare, the failure of healthcare to listen to transgender people, lack of gender reassignment provision, 
and the mental illness label and in leisure, increasingly how people were placed on the fringe, how they tried out at some point in gay life, and how eventually they became part of the trans community. Discrimination, we determined, resulted from seeing difference. So people were at most, most danger of being discriminated when they were in the process of transition, when they were most visible as transsexual people. After that, if they kept their life secret, it stopped. These, I'm just going to highlight a very, very few of the results, but for example, in employment, 24% in the first year were refused use of gender appropriate toilets. 11% were actually criminally assaulted at work, but they did not take it to the police. They were desperate to keep their job. 62% were generally harassed and abused at work. Only 3% had no workplace problems. Now, a thousand transsexual people almost responded to this survey. This wasn't a group of a small group of people, this was a very large group of people. Other lack of social protections, uh, just touch on a few effects, was that 37% of trans people were excluded from family events. 45% reported family breakdown. 73% regularly experienced harassment in public. And 21% of people stopped going out completely. They just stayed at home. We also got to, to homophobic and transphobic crime to see if there was a similar set of levels. In fact, we discovered that transphobic people were far more likely, twice as likely almost, to be insulted and harassed, four times as likely to be victims of a hate incident or hate crime. But most importantly, we looked at the attempted suicide rate. You remember that previous piece of work? We found 65% of people before treatment, not after treatment, Four treatment didn't try to commit suicide, 40% once, 7% twice, and 14% more than twice. So that was 35% of trans people trying to commit suicide before treatment. That was the post-treatment figures, 8% of 3%. Pre-treatment, 35% and 21%. We took a comparison group, we looked at adults who still had severe mental health problems due to childhood-related Concerns. 19% only committed suicide, 19% compared to 35%, 12% compared to 4%. In other words, we proved that gender suicide treatment is effective. The Equality Act came into force in 2010. There is almost complete protection for transgender people in the workplace, in accessing goods and services, housing and facilities. There are very, very limited exceptions for single-sex organisations. What about the religious exemptions in that? Well, a lot of survey work was done, a lot of relationships with religious organisations were built up. The religious exemption in relation to gender reassignment in the Equality Act, well, there isn't one. There was not actually a problem. Plenty of churches and organisations were willing to accept transgender people. My wife and myself, who had taken our children to church for 15 years before we got married, and the church wrote to us and asked us, would we like to get married there? We were part of the church family. Does the act work? Does the act work? Well, how many discrimination cases have been brought to court since the Equality Act came into force? Now, whoever's phone it is, you know what I say to students when their phone goes? <laughs> <laughs> there have been no cases related to gender reassignment treatment taken to the Act courts in relation to the Equality Act since it came into force. It worked really effectively. Lots of public education, lots of change in public and private policies in the workplace. Transgender people have um, so different to life now compared to. 40 years ago. So, the mechanisms have changed. There was discrimination. As an organisation, press for change and challenge through case law. That ultimately resulted in the government allowing us to present research. That research provided education, which provided legislation which protected people. So, I will finish with how frightening are we? Right, Shinigan. In 1966, that's my typing. 
became world champion downhill skier women. He's a ski tutor in Austria, he's a national champion. He's somebody who's a full part of the community, has adopted with his wife four children who have been brought up like our children to be good members of the community and society. It does work in the end if there is conversation in that dialogue. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me. Also, for me, it's an honor to be here, and I'm really excited to see so many interested people uh, to discuss this very important uh, topic. Um, I'm the Advocacy Director in the LGBTI Rights Program at Human Rights Watch. Human Rights Watch is an international human rights organization, an NGO. Uh, we have about 400 staff members and we work in about 90 countries in the world. And we work on all kind of human rights abuses. Um, we have an arms division, a business and human rights division, children's rights division, women's rights division. I work for the LGBTI rights program. Um, but today actually, um, because I'm Dutch, I'm from the Netherlands, and I used to be a member of parliament in the Netherlands, a legislator. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Netherlands and the anti-discrimination legislation for people, LGBTI people, in the Netherlands and their legal protection. So, let me go to the first slide. In our constitution, which was established uh, and renewed in the early 80s of the last century, Article 1 is the non-discrimination uh, article, and it gives uh, specific grounds um, for people not to discriminate. For instance, it's not allowed to discriminate on the basis of your race, your religion, your political belief, your gender. And the article then ends, in Dutch of course, but translated would be on any other ground. So if you are discriminated on uh, the basis of physical handicap, for instance, that's also not allowed and that is and comprised in and on any other grounds. Um, based on the Constitution, there are several general laws to protect people against discrimination. There is a general law on equal treatment, and that says that no direct, but also not, no indirect uh, discrimination is allowed. And in this general uh, law on equal treatment, homo and heterosexual orientation is specifically mentioned. So when you read the law, you can read it's not allowed to discriminate somebody on the basis of his or her hetero or homosexual orientation. This general law, as you can see, uh, is applicable in very uh, many areas of daily life. Um, so it's applicable on the labor market, um, social economic relations like in housing, or health, or welfare, or culture, or education. Now, of course, there are exceptions. Um, and this is uh, going to be a little bit legalistic, but um, sometimes you are allowed, according to the Dutch legislation, to make a difference and not to treat people equally. For instance, if the different treatment can be objectively, objectively justified by a legitimate goal and the means to achieve that goal are appropriate and necessary. Now, this is a very difficult sentence and behind every word there is jurisprudence and lots of court cases 
<laughs> For instance, if you would ask what is objectively, that's already a, a large discussion. According to the um, Supreme Court in the Netherlands, it's what reasonably acting people in similar situations would do. And of course, that's also uh, a lot of interpretation going on there. As you can see, the law is not applicable within religious institutions, organizations. That doesn't mean that they are allowed to discriminate. And I would like to give you a few examples. For instance, um, when same-sex marriage was introduced uh, into the Dutch legislation, there were a lot of officials who were officiating marriages, and they said, well, my religious beliefs uh, don't allow it to uh, perform, uh, same, to officiate in same-sex marriages. Um, the um, parliament then decided, you know what, we grant them an exception. So um, basically the rule is now that all new officials, so people who would like to be hired by a municipality tomorrow, for instance, they have to promise to conduct all marriages, so also same-sex marriages. But the people who were already in and working, uh, they are allowed to uh, say, okay, uh, we are exempt from this. And of course, in the course of the years, this group becomes smaller and smaller, and in a few years, or maybe a few decades time, all officials will be officiating all kinds of marriages. Let me give you an example of how difficult it is, and it might be interesting for the Hong Kong situation. If you have a religious school, is a school allowed to say, no, we don't want a gay or homosexual teacher? In the Netherlands, it is arranged like this, that, um, and I give you a concrete example, there was a teacher in a religious school, he was very popular, and every year he was reviewed, and he was the best teacher in the school. He was homosexual, and the school board knew this, and also the students knew this. He didn't talk about it, but people knew. Um, according to Dutch legislation, the mere fact of being homosexual is not enough for a religious school to fire a teacher. The mere fact, that's not enough. Something else should be added to it. So what happened, this teacher fell in love with a man and he married this man. And then the school said, well, this is too much because you are a teacher in a religious school. Now that you are married, this is something else than the mere fact, so we fire you. You are not allowed to teach in school anymore. Well, he didn't agree. He said, but every year you say that I'm the best qualified teacher. I do my job very well and the students are very enthusiastic. He went to um, court and the court said he is right. So the school is not allowed to fire him simply because he expressed his sexual orientation in the private sphere by getting married. He didn't talk about it all the time in school or whatever. So uh, the court said, no, uh, this is not allowed to fire him. Of course, because of the court case, the relation with the school became very tense, and that's actually the reason why he finally left the school, because of tense relationships between the school and him. I would like to also say that uh, the Dutch government finds it very important that students know about the facts of life. So in the Dutch education system, um, it is mandatory to teach children about facts of life, and amongst facts of life is also sexual diversity. It's not propaganda, but it's uh, teaching children that there is more than only heterosexual relationships. Um, let me now continue with the slides. The penal code, of course, also protects people against discrimination, and also here, hetero or homosexual orientation is explicitly mentioned. Um, there are many categories in the penal code, I will not go into all of them, but um, discriminatory insults, 
it's a crime or inciting to discrimination or participating in an organization that has as goal to discriminate others, all those things are punishable and sometimes with years of imprisonment. There are other regulations in the Netherlands, legal regu regulations, that protect LGBTI people, but in a different way. I briefly mentioned uh, the Same-Sex Marriage Act since 2001. In the Netherlands, same-sex couples, so two men or two women, can get married. Um, and I should emphasize that uh, and introducing anti-discrimination legislation does not automatically lead to same-sex marriage. You might think that, but it's not the case, of course. I can give you the example of Germany, for instance. Germany has very extensive anti-discrimination legislation, but the German legislators said, no, we don't want to introduce marriage equality. We have civil unions or registered partnership in Germany. But uh, in the Netherlands, so we had debates and we introduced same-sex marriage, adoption by same-sex couples, which of course also gives protection to children who are raised by same-sex couples. Uh, very recently, legal motherhood of the female partner of a biological mother um, will have a legal um, recognized relationship with the child without needing to adopt the child. And then very recently also a gender recognition law for transgender people has been introduced. So somebody who uh, transitions from male to female or from female to male doesn't need sex reassignment surgery anymore, but can go to the municipality and ask for a new identification document together with a statement by a professional uh, expert on transgender issues that this person is genuinely, um, genuinely um, wanting to live according to the preferred gender. And then my last slide, um, there are of course uh, many more other uh, laws in the Netherlands, but when we are talking about legislation, legislation in itself is of course not enough. Uh, what needs to be done is that these uh, laws need to get hands and feet, as we say in Dutch. So, for instance, we have anti-discrimination offices in all parts of the country, and when somebody thinks, okay, I'm discriminated against, you can go to such an office, it's free, and you can say, this is what happened to me, is this discrimination according to the law, and can you help me? And sometimes people are then referred to lawyers, for instance. Of course, there are a lot of NGOs working on discrimination issues, very active. Um, there are very many role models, so when, now that we are talking about homosexuality, there are many openly gay or lesbian people or transgender people or bisexual people in the business community, in politics. I was the first openly gay member of parliament, but also in the arts world, uh, also in religious institutions, in school systems. So in every field of life there are role models, which is very important for younger people that they realize they are not the only one. There is a mandatory registration of hate crimes. So for instance, if you are a gay man and you are beaten up on the street, and your attackers say, we beat you up because you are gay or we perceive you to be gay, you go to the police and the police is required to register this. The interesting thing is that this uh, started about seven years ago, that because of the registration, it becomes very visible that there are many incidents of hatred against homosexual people. Journalists have discovered that and write about it so when now a man is beaten up on the street because of his homosexuality, it will be front page news. Well, 10 years ago, you could read uh, a man has been beaten up on page 10 of the newspaper. But now it is visible, people write about it, and uh, the downside of it is that people now think there is an increase of violent attacks against 
uh, homosexual people, which I don't think is the case, but 10 years ago, we didn't register it, so we didn't know it. There is a pink police force, so openly gay and lesbian policemen and women joined into the police force and um, they actually communicate with uh, the LGBT community, so it's very easy, there's a lot of trust, so when there is an incident happening, you know, when you go to the police, you ask for somebody of the pink police force, it works very well. Then, um, lastly, I would say, there is an expertise bureau at the uh, state prosecutor's office, um, because sometimes it's very difficult to uh, to realize is this legal discrimination or not, and so you can go to that office as well. They work together with the anti-discrimination offices. And the last uh, protective measure for LGBTI people in the Netherlands is, of course, all the um, uh, policies and legislation that is inspired by the European Union or the Council of Europe. So there is also a lot of European influence on the Dutch situation. Usually it's been translated into Dutch legislation. So there is a lot of protecting uh, measures uh, for LGBTI people in the Netherlands. But that doesn't mean there is no discrimination, because of course discrimination will always take, pl take place. But therefore it's very important that the government is on the side of the victims and protects its citizens. So I wish you a wonderful debate and also I also wish you um, a wonderful outcome of the debate and I hope that LGBTI people will be protected by the law in Hong Kong. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Boris. I'd now like to invite Alice Milan who will talk about the Australian experience. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Alice Mullen. I'm a registered foreign lawyer here in Hong Kong, um, but an Australian legal practitioner. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the Australian experience and what protections there are for LGBTI persons from discrimination under Australian laws. So I'll start by just giving you an overview of the Australian legal landscape in general. So it's a bit, um, there's a whole lot of different jurisdictions within Australia itself. Um, and they'll give, I'll then give you an overview of the laws themselves, what exemptions are available, and then run through a recent case study. So Australia is a federation, which means that there's laws that cover the whole of Australia, but then there's also seven, uh, six different states that have their own laws. So it means that anti-discrimination laws in Australia aren't just set out in one source. You really need to look at seven different pieces of legislation to work out what your protections are and when they'll apply. So this um, slide here is meant, it sets out the pieces of legislation that provide anti-discrimination protections for LGBTI persons. Um, you'll see, I've set out in the right hand column the fields of protections. So you'll see that there's LGBTI but in some jurisdictions it's not all those attributes obtain protections. So there's the federal legislation. It, the Act itself is 1984, but the protections for LGBTI persons were introduced in um, 2013, and so they're very well drafted, in my view, and they really reflect the, the recent timings of reforms and the understanding of the situations in which discrimination issues can arise. Whereas the, some other jurisdictions perhaps haven't been drafted with the same um, understanding of issues. So, for example, many of the um, states, I've got I intersex in brackets there. It's because there's protections afforded for, to an intersex person who, a person of indeterminate sex who seeks to um, identify as one particular sex, which is all well and good, but it raises the issue of what happens if you have an intersex person who doesn't actually seek to identify as a particular sex, do they, do they get the protections under the Act? And so that's a bit of a question mark. I've set out here um, the circumstances of well, the type of discrimination that's protected, the general areas where that protection is afforded, and then exemptions that apply. So the 
Direct and indirect discrimination is basically the baseline standard of protection. Direct discrimination is when you treat a person less favourably than someone who with, um, less favourably than someone who doesn't have the relevant attribute. And then you've got indirect discrimination, which is imposing a condition or requirement that's likely to have an adverse impact on someone with the relevant attribute. That's the general protections in all um, uh, all, all jurisdictions. Um, then you also have some more um, particular protections like anti-vilification, anti-victimisation, um, and some other protections. The coverage areas are really quite broad, work, education, provision of goods and services and accommodation. And then you've got exemptions. I mean, the list here looks quite long, but they, the exemptions really pro, pro, um, are provided in certain specific circumstances and you have to meet certain threshold issues that this is the main um, states. So just to drill down a bit on when these exemptions might apply, I'm just going to go through a couple of examples. The first is for educational institutions. So you have to keep in mind again that Australia has these number of states having their own laws and the federal law. So if there's not one one law for educational institutions. Most states and the federal system do exempt um, educational institutions in some circumstances. Um, for example, and mostly it's religious educational institutions. But then there are also some qualifications on when that will apply. So, um, so one state, for example, South Australia, has an exemption for religious in educational institutions hiring staff. But that institution has to have a written policy which sets out up front what, what, their, um, what their standards are, what, how they will act, and that policy needs to be made freely available. So um, it's not, you can't say with the benefit of hindsight or something was done because we're a religious educational institution, um, you need to have that set out up front. One of the more controversial um, exemptions is provided in New South Wales, which is um, Australia's most populated state. It provides an exemption for private educational institutions, and there's no conditions on that. It doesn't need to have a religious affiliation or ideological view. Um, it's provided, it's a blanket coverage, and the, the actual practice that is discriminatory doesn't need to accord with any type of ideological or religious views. Um, so this was, this is controversial and there was a, um, there was um, a piece of legislation put forward just last year um, by um, the minority uh, members of parliament to amend this piece of legislation and it got quite a bit of coverage and generally positive support but um, the majority um, party, with, so the party in, in government um, announced they wouldn't be supporting the change so the bill with, with, was withdrawn and this board exemption continues to apply. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have Tasmania, which has no exemptions for educational institutions. Uh, the next exemption I'll look at is an exemption for religious bodies. So again, most Australian jurisdictions have such a carve out. Um, and there, there's an exemption when you're hiring, training, or um, educating members of the religion, so priests and ministers, for example, and that's fairly uncontroversial. Um, but then you also have a more general exemption for religious bodies. Um, again, there's different, you're dealing with a whole lot of different jurisdictions, so there's different um, definitions, but generally you need to be a, a body established for religious purpose to get the benefit of this exemption. And then the actual practice that is alleged to be discriminatory needs to meet certain standards. So these again, it's not exactly the same between all states, um, but this is the general requirement, um, that the discriminatory act or practice needs to conform with the doctrines or beliefs of the religion. And it's usually or, but there's some statements and, but or, it's reasonably, sometimes it's reasonably, sometimes it's necessary, to avoid injury to the religious sensibilities of the followers of that religion. So first of all, you need to be a religious body, and then the actual practice needs to have really some connection or be conformity with, with the religion that you're established in relation to. 
So a case, the case study that I'm going to look at really discusses this religious uh, bodies exemption, and it's um, just recently been decided this year in the Supreme Court of Victoria. It involved an application um, so yeah, that, that issue was a refusal by Christian Youth Camps Limited, it's a corporation, um, to allow um, a camping resort to be hired by Cobal. Cobal um, wanted to hire the facilities for a weekend camp to be attended by same-sex attracted young presence, and this application was refused. Um, just for a bit of background on who CYC is, um, they have a constitution, that they are a corporation, and their constitution um, included that their purpose was this, that, that they were established to conduct camping, conferencing, and similar, similar facilities for the benefit of the community and in accordance with fundamental beliefs and doctrines of the Christian Brethren. So they, um, the corporation itself was established by the um, Christian Brethren Trust, and it does have this overriding um, kind of principle of wanting to provide these camping services in a, uh, in a Christian manner, but its, it's, it's purpose was really to just to run this camping facility. So Cobal and the, um, the people that it was trying to book the accommodation for alleged that it had been direct, there had been direct discrimination. There had been a refusal of accommodation on the basis of sexual orientation. And CYC first, first of all argued there was no discrimination. Then they argued that if there had been um, discrimination, it was exempt on the basis that it was a religious body and it either conformed with the doctrines of the Christian brethren religion or was necessary to avoid injury to the followers of that religion. So first of all, the court had to consider whether CYC was in fact a religious body. And the court, it was, there was a dissenting judgment, but the majority um, of the judgment was that no, that the CYC was not a religious body. And making this decision, the court said that the purpose of CYC was to make campsite accommodation available to the public for hire. And just because the objects of CYC was to create a Christian atmosphere, that didn't convert a secular purpose, the running of a campsite, into a religious purpose. So there was no exemption available. But the court did helpfully go and examine if it was a religious body, well, would the other limbs be satisfied? So the first limb is whether that refusal um, accorded with the doctrines of the religion. And the court really had some difficulty saying how, how, could, a, how could issues of uh, doctrine, uh, doctrine conform, issues of conformity with the doctrine arise in a purely secular activity? Um, and, and said that these really, this question really couldn't arise, but again, said if it did, well, it was it in conformity with those um, religious principles? And the court said no. That there was a number of um, expert testimony and evidence that was taken into account. But, and, the, and the court decided that even though um, people who were followers of the religion would have to restrict their own sexual activity, it did not require them to avoid contact with persons that did not subscribe to their faith. And the court said that in order to get the benefit of these exemptions, which allow discriminatory conduct, there needs to be a requirement or obligation in the religion to act a particular way in order for the in order to benefit from the exemption. Um, and it couldn't merely be permissible under the religion to act in a certain way. So it's a relatively high standard, and that was to be read, read into the um, legislation on purposive <coughs> grounds. <laughs> so, so the, the court decided that it wasn't, um, it wasn't in conformity with the doctrines of the religion. They then considered the other um, option, which is it's necessary to avoid injury um, to the sensibilities of the persons who follow that religion. Um, and again, the court rejected this argument. And they said that if the parliament could not have intended to exempt actions of a body from the general prohibitions against discrimination, unless obedience to the prohibitions could be seen to have a real and direct impact on the religious sensibilities of members of the religion. 
And they looked at the history of the circumstances in which CYC otherwise made these camping facilities available um, and the requirements that they put on those attendees. And there was no history of, of looking into the um, sexual orientation or religious background of those attendees. Um, and they also said that, so CYC had really demonstrated a lack of connection between the religion and the activities of CYC's accommodation business. They said that if CYC had been able to show that the campsite was a place of religion, of religious observance, for example, it would have been easier to satisfy the court that the use of those premises to affirm safe sex relationships did cause injury to the sensibilities of the organisation. But as it was, there was, there was, there was, no, there was no demonstration of that connection. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a background of the Australian system. It is important to keep in mind that there are a whole lot of different pieces of legislation, but generally, um, generally there are the broad protections for LGBTI persons, um, and most jurisdictions will have exemptions, although um, with quite stringent requirements on um, when those will be available. That's it. Thank you. I'd like to pass to Mr. Chan, who will give us the Taiwanese experience. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, uh, first of all, I would like to say sorry uh, for my own convenience and uh, giving more precise and much more introduction to everyone. Uh, the following uh, presentation I will be giving you in Mandarin, so I hope you don't mind. And I think it's also important to show you uh, that the diversity for today's public program. Okay, now uh, I would like to change my tongue in Mandarin. Uh, uh, 各位好,我是張宏成,我來自台灣。那今天我要想跟大家分享是台灣有關於對於同志人權保障的一些 法律的经验那前几天美国盖洛普公司他们发表了全世界对于同志友善的国家那台湾排名第全亚洲规模最大的同志游戏那首先我想先给大家是看到给大家一个基本的认识是同事在台湾的一个现状延续英国的立法例有这样子对同性性行为的一个处罚那另外就是所谓的合法性行为同一年里违反这个所谓的性侵害的性侵组的这样的一个性侵害犯罪呢特别的规范婚姻一定是要一男一女
不过在解释上，就是呃，政府的解释当然依循着呃传统的中国文化，还是认为民法上的婚姻必须要是一男一女。但是这样的一个定义呢，渐渐的被呃法院所挑战。那如同大家也知道，我们台湾呃去年呢。呃，对于这民法的修正，能够让同性伴侣也能够结婚的这样的一个法律修正案呢，已经在国会进行一读通过了。那现在已经进入二读，所以在同性伴侣上呢，这个台湾的一个状况其实也呃继续在前进。那也有相关的案子现在在最高行政法院在打诉讼，也就是针对民法上到底承不承认同性伴侣的这样的一个婚姻的权利，也是在法院进行诉讼。那再就是有关于这个性别重置，也就是所谓的变性，在台湾呢，并没有明确的法律规范来保障呃性别重置者，也就是所谓的呃性别认同少数的这样的一个问题。那现在只有一个行政规则。不过等一下我们会介绍台湾对于呃这个跨性别或者是性别重置者的婚姻呢，我们的定义是非常明确，一定是按照法律上的性别。所以跟香港去年的 W 的案子也。是非常不一样，啊，所以这是大概简单的告诉大家台湾对于同志人权保障的一个现状。那如同呃，我们这次会议就是，到底香港到底应不应该成立这样特别制定一个法律来保障这个 LGBT？ 那我想给大家介绍台湾的经验是，台湾当然在早期也是在讨论，那这个。呃，事件是一个非常重要的事件，是促成我们对于呃同性伴呃呃对于 LGBTI 的学生在校园里面的权利应该如何保障，那是一个叶永志的事件。那他是一个国中生，那嗯十二年前他莫名其妙在学校就死亡，那一直查不出原因。那这个案件在台湾社会进行呃产生了非常大的震撼，就是一个呃年轻的小朋友。突然间就在学校死掉了。那一般认为是因为他的一个性气气呃性的气质、性别气质比较女性化，然后可能在学校被霸凌。那因此呢，我们台湾的立法者呢就在两千零四年制定了所谓的两性平等教育法。后来这个两性用中文大家应该就知道，它两性本来就是指它可能原来只是预设是男性跟女性。但是后来这个法律就修正，变成是性别平等教育法。那等一下我们会看到，性别的意思就是比较 general 的一个概念，变成是我们有保障性别、性倾向跟性别认同。好，所以这是呃一个很重要的一个例子。那另外就是有关于这个性别认同的问题，那这个也是一个很重要的事件，就是十三年呃十三年前这个蔡雅婷她本来是一个男性。那在台湾呢，你只要要变更你法律上的性别登记，也就是你要呃换你的身份证，也就是所谓的 ID， 那你必须要进行所谓的完全的性别重置手术。那这个蔡雅婷她并没有进行这个手术，但是她想要换她 ID 上的照片。那因为呃政府认为说，行政机关、护政机关认为你现在还是男性，所以呢你不可以换女性的照片。那这个案子就引起很大的争论，后来法律就改变。那现在呢，我们只要进行所谓的部分的重置手术，你就可以变更你的法律上的性别登记。好，那在台湾，呃，在香港现在讨论就是说，我们到底是要制定一个一个一般性的反歧视法，还是特别针对某些啊、呃、情况来制定个别的那个？反歧视法。那刚才 Boris 也有介绍从宪呃宪法的角度，那我也想要从宪法的角度，就是台湾呢的宪法其实很明确的规范呃平等权的保障。那我们确实也有想要制定一个完一个比较广泛的反歧视法，在两千零三年，不过这个后来没有成功，因为它牵涉的范围实在太大了。所以后来台湾的政府呢采取的是个别立法，所以等一下我们看到它是在学校里面跟职场里面禁止不可以。针对这个学生、教职员或者是求职者的性别、性倾向跟性别认同有歧视或差别待遇。那这个我们刚才已经讲，两千零四年，就是十年前，台湾的第一部的法律叫《性别平等教育法》，就呃立法通过，那禁止学校针对学生的性别、性倾向、性别认同跟性别气质而有差呃不合理的差别待遇。那这个学校呢，包含公私立各级学校。所以，像即便是宗教学校，它也受到这个法律的限制，不可以因为学生或教职员的性倾向而有差别待遇。啊，那这个是一个基本的，呃，这整部法律的一个完整的架构。我们可以看到
，这个保障的范围呢非常广泛，从学生要不要可不可以进入这个学校，到学生要什么时候什什么样条件可以毕业，这整个。程序呃，这整个时间里面都是要受到这部呃法律的保障。那这部法律分别保障你要一个平性别平等的学习环境，跟一个安全的校园空间。那这里比较大争议在台湾是，大家可以看到这个有关于课程设置那部分会有涉及情感教育、性教育跟统治教育。那这个引起台湾一些呃宗教团体，还有一些家长团体认为说不应该在学校里面教性教育跟统治教育。不过这个法律明确的规范，学校不需要进行这样的教育。好，那这是一个。呃，例子就是到底学校宗教学校可不可以因为当事人的性别或性倾向而进行不合理的差别待遇？那这是一个非常有名的私立学校，它是一个宗教支持的私立学校。那它是一个数学非常有名的男老师，但是他在婚姻呃过程当中，他想要变性，那这就引发学校会认为说你不应该变性，你可以会给学生性别认同造成呃呃不好的示范，所以呢。当时就在讨论要不要，可不可以给他解雇？但是后来呢，这个学校并没有做这个事情。一旦因为法律明确禁止，不可以因为当事人的性别认同而有歧视或差别待遇。那如同刚才 Boris 也讲到，就是说单纯作为一个同性恋者或者是性别重置者，你不可以因为单纯这样的一个事件而就给予解雇或者其他不合理差别待遇。好，那所以这个在这个。工作职场上呢，我们台湾从两千零八年也禁止，不可以针对性别跟性倾向有歧视或差别待遇。那再来就是一个台湾比较特别的情况是，台湾因为它的国际地位的一个特殊性，所以我们一直想要进入国际社会。所以台湾即便没有明确的，除了其他领域、学校跟工作职场外，没有其他的反歧视法，但是我们慢慢的引进所谓的国际人权公约。那大家可以看到，我们现在我们有呃引进这个两公约，然后再来我们有儿童权呃消除妇女对妇女一切歧视的公约的 CDO， 然后再来就是呃儿童权利公约、身心障碍者权利公约，都现在已经在台湾被正式的立法，然后给予保障。所以这样的一个国际公约的一个规范架构，也纳入了台湾的内国法。那我最后想要跟大家分享是两个案子，就是我们刚才可以看到，到底性别的概念是什么？假如法律法律的规范是很狭隘的，我们今天只有讲到性别，或者是性别认同，或性倾向。那其他的一个歧视状况如何进入这个法律的适用？最重要就是法院如何去从这样的一个文字来去放宽。那等一下我们会分享周一人的案子。那最后就是，好，最后我就想要分享，就是我们今天即便呢立法通过了，一个很重要的是，行政机关或者是国家到底有什么样的政策可以来实践这个法律所保障的意志？那等一下，我们看到这个有关于很一个同性恋呃性别重置者的一个案件。那这是一个呃跨性别的一个呃医院，马偕医院也是一个宗教医院。那他在进行性别重置手术的过程当中，他开始着女装。那医院就认为说他不适合出现在公共场所，他本来是在柜台工作，就把他调到仓库去管一些仓库的一些事情。那当然他认为说这个是侵害他的工作权保障。那我们可以看一下法院怎么说。法院说，单纯因为他的服装打扮跟行为举止的女性化，造成呃医院的人事管理困扰。然后呢，这个是基于他着女装的女性倾向因素所谓的差别待遇，然后就会构成性别歧视。因为我们现在的这个工作职场上只保障性别跟性别呃性倾向，并没有性别认同。但是透过法院的解释，性别认同已经进到很广义的性别的概念。好。那最后一个是呃，我们要讲的是行政机关在法律没有规范的状态之下，如何透过行政裁量权来保障 LGBT 或者是同志的人权？那这是一对呃性别重置者的一个婚姻。那刚才我已经告诉大家，台湾如何去判断什么人可以结婚，是完全根据你法律上的性别登记。那我们可以看一下，我们大概有这三种情况。那他可能是原来最后这种情况，就是我们现在这个例子，他本来是两个同性的，那其中一个先变性，那就符合了台湾的现在的民法规范，你只要是一男一女就可以结婚的。那所以结婚之后呢，另外一个人也变性了，所以变成是他们合法的婚姻成立关系成立之后，变成两个相同的法律上的性别。那这到底他们的婚姻关系是要如何去判断？那我们台湾的互证机关认为。
系结婚的时候成立的性别来做认定。所以，只要你在结婚的状态、结婚的当时，你是法律上认定的一男一女，你就可以合法结婚。不管你的身体性别是什么，不管你结婚之后你的身、你的法律上性别如何变更。那这是台湾透过行政机关的一个裁量权，给予这样的一个人权保障。好，那最后我想要分享的是台湾的经验，到底香港应该要采取个别立法，还是制定一部单一的完整的反歧视法？那我想这个有这个需要看每个国家或者是香港他们的你这个立法的长期跟短期的目标。你想要达成短期的话，就是你现在大制定的单独立法。当然很快就可以通过，然后可以针对个别的领域，但是其他领域就必须要慢慢透过个别法律的维持。那再就是立法技术跟其他执行机关的整合，所以这边看香港的立法局、立法会如何去运作。那再就是，我觉得这个歧视分类标准应该要明确，就是我们定了这部法律，应该要明确规范禁止的差别待遇的类型，到底是要针对性别、性倾向或性别认同。那最后一个大家很关心的除外条款。在台湾的这两部法律里面呢，我们的除外条款只有两个，一个是历史传统跟特定的教育目标，这是在学校里面；另外一个是工作性质。大家可以看到，完全没有宗教的因素在里面。那这当然也看台湾的社会或者是法律有一些不同的情况。但是我想要说的是，这个除外条款呢，在台湾的适用，这个现在刚才我们讲的适用于公司立学校，所以不分你是不是宗教学校，都必须要受到这个规范。那在我觉得法律的执行确实重于法律的规范。那刚才我们讲的同志教育，因为反对者，所以到现在我们都还没有完全延宕多年才开始实施。那再就是，我觉得一个专责的监督机关是很重要。香港假如说通过这样的反歧视法之后，到底由谁来执行这个法律？那在台湾，它就有一个专责的机构叫性别平等委员会。他会在学校里面、在职场里面、在各级政府跟在中央机关里面都有这样的一个机关设置。那当事人假如受到侵害的时候，你马上就可以就近申请这个呃，申向这个性平会来进行申诉。那最后就是台湾现在呃法律修正之后，他现在是严格要求你，假如违反这个法律，他公布你的姓名，然后所以公司也要公布，人民也要公布，个人也要公布，而且他会按次处罚。所以这是一个很重要的一个，我觉得是一个呃，为执行这个法律的一个机制。好，那最后就是，我想，假如说我们从工作职场上来合法之后，我觉得这是一个台湾现在面临的状况，就是我们到底要怎么去面临出柜的问题？因为即便你说学校保障了，工作职场保障，但是学生敢不敢出柜？他因为你只要站出来申诉，你就必须要面临出柜的问题。那这在香港或许也要考虑。那再就是。呃，我想从学校到进入职场，这是一个连贯的。所以学校如何有一个完整的一个训练计划，让学生进入职场之后，他可以知道他的权利保障，他不会因为他的性别性倾向受到差别待遇。我想这个也是一个很重要。那最后就是台湾现在的台北市政府呢，已经考虑要制定自治条例来保障同性恋者的呃 LGBTI 的一个工作权，甚至他们也要保障同性伴侣的婚姻权。所以这是台湾现在的状况，希望给大家一个参考。那等一下我们只要有机会的话，可以更多的讨论。谢谢。Thank you very much. And last but by no means least,、uh, Dr. Margaret Wu. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm not a PowerPoint sort of person,、uh, but my talk this morning will be relatively simple. I'm just asked to address the feasibility of legislation in Hong Kong. So I will divide my talk into three parts. First of all, general remarks about the feasibility of legislation in anti-discrimination law.、Uh, secondly, addressing particularly two areas. One is the area of sexual orientation, and the other.、Um, Area is gender, transgender、uh, legislation. So that should be.、Uh, Hong Kong is, in fact, very, very slow, according to me, in the progress of anti-discrimination law. I still remember when, in 1983, we talk about、uh, 
uh, homosexuality. We were talking about whether the word legalizing homosexual acts between consenting adults uh, was acceptable to the community. And the community will not accept that. And they have to change the word to decriminalization so that it is no longer a crime. Uh, and uh, that had taken many, many years from 1983 up to 1990. It was still a very sensitive matter. So today, looking back, uh, we started to have anti-discrimination law in 1995 when the uh, Anna Wu a legislator tried to uh, introduce um, uh, an umbrella uh, anti-discrimination law and she was unsuccessful. She had a very, very bitter experience. But her experience was not wasted because uh, although she failed to introduce blanket um, anti-discrimination law, the government did take up um, in different areas, just anti-discrimination in different areas, starting with sexual equality, uh, um, anti-sexual um, discrimination, and then disability, and then I think uh, work uh, um, and family status, that kind of thing. And now the EOC is talking about whether we should have continued to have different areas of legislation or whether we should again consider an umbrella uh, anti-discrimination legislation such as the Equality Act in the UK. Now that is, uh, um, in terms of discussing the uh, sexual orientation, anti-discrimination, and the transsexual arrangements legislation to permit that and to legalize, to prevent discrimination uh, against that. Then again, the, at the end of that, you would still think about whether it, in terms of these difficult areas, uh, whether we should be at the same time thinking of a, an umbrella legislation or continue with, lo with local legislation. That is a very interesting discussion, but uh, we may or may not have time for that. So uh, now, first of all, the general remarks about legislation. When is legislation feasible? Uh, speaking of, uh, as a, a former legislator of some experience when my special interest in the Legislative Council was actually not, uh, uh, um, uh, not, not actually filibustering. My, my particular interest was in uh, scrutinizing the legislation because I think that that is very important. It binds people's uh, conduct. So my observation is this. You divide uh, legislation into three main uh, steps. First of all is the social policy. You have to identify, you have to have a certain level of social consensus that we know what we are, in what area we're having legislation. Uh, the legislation, so that when the legislation actually is in place, it would have sufficient social support for it to be feasible. So if you pass a law which is irrational, which steps on everybody's rights, you are inviting social unrest. Now, uh, does it mean that until social, uh, there is a majority in society accepting minority rights, until that happens, we cannot have uh, anti-discrimination legislation? I think that is not how you look at it. Because if that is the case, you will never have legislation to protect the minority. Because by definition, you will have majority opposition, or at least majority indifference. Now, but here what we are looking at, especially in, in anti-discrimination areas, is our understanding. I, I would pinpoint two things. Uh, first of all, we have a consensus about the protection of human rights. That if a right is recognized as a basic human right, then this community has the consensus of protecting the human rights. Secondly, we also have the consensus that we have international obligations under these international covenants protecting rights that they should be given effect to. It is not just uh, something that you repeat as a, 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 a nice thing to say, but you actually have to implement to make sure that people can actually enjoy their rights. Now, so I think that generally speaking, we have that kind of consensus and recognition in Hong Kong. We also recognize as a society that certain rights are discriminated against and that a lot of us recognize uh, that these rights, it is not right 
to discriminate against certain people. Uh, so as to each area, the point is whether you can identify. For example, it is very easy to identify sexual discrimination. You're discriminating between a man and woman. A, a man, everybody knows, uh, females being given, say, a, a lower salary, men being given a high salary, we can see that. But when you say sexual orientation, does this community understand the delineation of what a sexual uh, agenda orientation means. That is uh, the, so the part of the social policy that we have to focus on. So this is the stage one. Secondly, we look at the framework of the, of the legislation. Do we know what the law should look like if we decide to pass a law to protect uh, against discrimination of certain uh, um, uh, groups? Then do we know what that law looks? Uh, looks like. And I think in Hong Kong we actually have got that stage as well because we have already a number of anti-discrimination law, law. We know that it, oh dear, I'm, I'm very slow, sorry. Um, we know that uh, we divide into areas that uh, first of all it binds the government, uh, secondly it, uh, I don't think you're allowed to do that, but anyway, thank you very much. Uh, secondly, it is a question of different areas, say employment, services, uh, accommodation uh, in all these areas. What is the discrimination? Uh, so we have. Hmm? No photographs. No photographs allowed. I think that there was. Uh, I don't mind photographs, but I think that there's a, there's a, a rule. It, it doesn't matter. Let, let, let's carry on. It is a matter for the organizers to decide what to do about photography. It's not for me. Anyway, so we have that framework. Now, the final part is about the precise legal provisions. That is to say, when you have each uh, area of legislation, then especially when you try to define uh, the exemptions. Uh, in each of these anti-discrimination laws, you have areas of exemption. So you have to take into consideration the particular concerns of the community and decide whether there should be exemptions and if you should have exemptions, how wide or how narrow those exemptions ought to be in order to make sure that when the law is passed, it is going to have a relatively uh, a reasonable chance of being observed. Now, so when there is concern, I believe that it is a matter for the legislature when you are drafting a bill, when you are listening to different views, whether you have the legal skill to deal with this kind of exemption. And I fully have confidence that we have the kind of uh, legal skill in order to do that. Now, every now and then, the political concerns would override the legal and the, and the human rights concerns. For example, in the, in the only dis anti-discrimination bill that I have chaired, which was the Racial Discrimination Ordinance, uh, what happened was that there were such concerns that they wanted to cut out blanket exemption of language and of, of uh, a certain nationality. So that if I discriminate, so under the law it says that if I discriminate against you on ground of language, that doesn't count as racial discrimination. I think that that was unconscionable. But because the government had no, no uh, uh, confidence of passing through this bill without this exception, it was allowed in. In the end, we managed to cut it down, but that is a different story. It's a very funny story, but that, that's a, uh, for another day. But that kind of exemption really perpetuates a very large areas of, of discrimination, and this is not something I would recommend. Now, that is why when we come back to the, the EOC's recent cons uh, 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 consultation, we go back to the problem of doing away with these blanket exemptions, but have exemptions, uh, specific exemptions, which are justifiable on the basis of legitimacy and of reasonableness and proportionality. So on all three grounds, I think that we are well placed 
to proceed with these uh, um, areas. Now, I particularly now want to use the time left to me um, to address the two particular points of sexual orientation. I think that we have made extremely good progress as far as sexual orientation is concerned because of the role of the courts. First of all, we have achieved, made a great achievement in a court case for William Love and the Secretary for Justice. Now that was a case of someone who was gay and because of our, our criminal law, he is not allowed to engage in the only kind of sexual intercourse which was open to him until he reaches the age of 21. And even at the age of 21, there are things that he is not allowed to do, although other people, uh, heterosexual people, can do it. And so the, import, the court ruled that this, these uh, criminal laws are um, unconstitutional because they're in breach of the protection under the basic law of equality before the law. And that is a very important victory, not just for gay people, but for Hong Kong as a community, because we have made an advancement. I particularly want to recommend to you the judgment of uh, Mr. Justice Hartman, not only because of the decision, but because in describing what uh, uh, he, the court was, being, was dealing with, he talked about the kind of suffering which these laws create unjustifiably. And I'd just like to read this. And he says that it is the applicant's case that his knowledge of the physical desires which define his sexual orientation are perceived by the law to be a form of deviance warranting condign criminal punishment has led to feelings of low self-esteem and ongoing denial of his true identity, even to those closest to him. The result has been a sense of marginalization and what I infer to be a profound uncertainty as to his own moral worth as a member of the Hong Kong community. So this court decision, I recommend people to read the judgment because it tells you if you are not gay, and I'm not, but looking at the judgment, it gives you a much greater understanding of what a part of the community faces. And I think that this gives us the kind of confidence in our courts being able to... Now, in spite of this being a sensitive and a very controversial matter. The judgment is to be recommended because you can see how such problems can be dealt with rationally on legal principles and in a way which is fair to all parties. So I think that as far as gender or uh, sexual orientation is concerned, we have a court decision which defines what, the, what sexual orientation amounts to the basis for removing the discrimination, and we also have the legal apparatus to do that. So if the, you would, you would uh, uh, give me the indulgence that the transsexual, the uh, judgment in W and the uh, register of uh, um, marriage. Now here is again the court stepping in to say that uh, uh, this is in fact quite absurd. When you say, that, can you change your sex or are you stuck? with the sex you are born with. Now, I have to go back a bit to the sexual orientation. The most important thing that changed was that in my younger days, being gay was considered not only a deviance, but it was supposed to be a lifestyle matter. Either there are people who say that you are sick, therefore if you are gay, you are sick, or you say that if you're gay, it is because you're attracted to that kind of uh, a very immoral lifestyle. Now what this judgment says is that that is not the case. That it is, it is sexual orientation is something that you are born with. Now again in the W case, the court again relied on medical evidence. That is to say that they, when you have a dis, uh, 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 an incongruity between what you consider your sex to be and the body you are born with, and people are allowed to change it. So the, the particular um, uh, nature of the judgment, the character of the judgment of the CFA, of the Court of Final Appeal, is the large amount of evidence, of medical ev evidence, psychological evidence, social evidence, to tell you about uh, trying to check the gender change. And so the court decided in favor of W, 
and said that when someone had gone through so much surgery, that that person must be recognized as having changed his sex or her sex, and therefore, uh, for the purpose of marriage, we're not talking about a same-sex marriage, we are talking about the kind of marriage we have now. And the only question is whether you are stuck with the, the sex you are born with. So that is a very powerful judgment. But uh, unfortunately, the court, when uh, having made the ruling, recommended that we pass legislation because to deal with uh, a sex, a, a, a gender assignment, uh, because there are numbers of things which is not just recognition of a person's rights, but it has social repercussions and how, for example, one of the, the um, cases mentioned by one of the speakers is if you were, if you were married at a time when uh, um, you uh, if after marriage one person changes sex so that both becomes female or both uh, are male, then what happens to the marriage, what happens to the children and so on. And these matters have to be dealt with and they cannot be dealt with in a judgment, they have to be dealt with in, in uh, legislation. So the court recommended the Legislative Council to pass legislation in order to deal with these things and the court very considerately mentioned the recognition of Gender Act in the UK which is a bit dated but because it is dated perhaps it is easier to accept in this community. Well, unfortunately our Legislative Council, our government have failed at the court. The actual bill which was introduced into LegCo mainly uh, by adding certain sections to the marriage ordinance. In fact, require you to go through the full uh, surgery, all the treatment uh, before you can be, uh, you can change your sex. And I think that that is the wrong thing to do. Now, I'd like to end on a, a lighter note. And uh, uh, some of you may know uh, Mr. Justice Bukhari, he's now uh, a non-permanent just judge uh, of the Court of Final Appeal, and he has this cartoon book called The Law is a Crocodile. And, if, and here is a picture of a very pretty woman. She, he really likes pretty uh, women barristers. And this uh, was talking about to the crocodile, another of his favorite. And the lady barrister said, the court is making a lot of law. And the crocodile said, somebody has to. The Legislative Council spends so much of its time trying cases. So since the Legislative Council is not doing its job of passing laws, it now falls upon the Court of Final Appeal uh, to, to actually change our law to protect minorities. Uh, and, uh, but there is only that much the Court can do. The rest has to be with your government and with your Legislative Council, and I hope that you will push for these changes, not only for the sake of people who are being discriminated against unjustified, unjustly, and because of their suffering, but also because as a community, this is not something we are, we should be proud about. Thank you very much. to all our speakers for their very um, interesting presentations and for their sharing of different experiences across a range of jurisdictions.